Welcome back to the Deep Dive Stock Explorers. Today, we're uh, taking a close look at Navita Semiconductor. Right, a company that's really pushing the envelope in next generation power semiconductors. Gallium nitride GAN and silicon carbide or Siki. Exactly, and these aren't your standard silicon chips. They bring some, well, serious advantages to the table. They really do. Think of a silicon as, you know, reliable, it gets the job done. But GAN and Siki, they're like the performance versions. Higher speeds, higher temperatures, higher voltages. Which means basically more power, more efficiency in smaller packages. Precisely. Better efficiency, higher power density, better thermal performance too. Okay, let's uh, break that down a bit. GAN, for instance, it switches electricity super fast, right? Incredibly fast. And that means less energy just gets wasted as heat. Like flicking a light switch on and off instantly so it doesn't even have time to warm up? Kind of, yeah. And because it's so fast, the other components around it, like capacitors and inductors, can be much smaller and lighter. Which leads to those tiny phone chargers we see everywhere now. That's a perfect example. And Saxis. It excels with heat and really high voltages. So better for the heavy-duty stuff. Exactly. Think electric vehicles, industrial power, data centers. It handles the pressure, electrical and thermal. So you need less complex, less bulky cooling. Got it. Now, Navitas describes itself as a pure play, next generation power semiconductor company. Yeah. What does pure play signal to us? It means this is all they do. Mm -hmm. Their entire focus is GAN and SACS technology. They aren't spread thin across other semiconductor types. Right. Hyper-focused. No. And their main products. They have their GAN Fast Power Integrated Circuits, or ICs. These cleverly combine the GAN power switch with the driver and protection circuits all onto one chip. Makes things simpler for designers. Definitely. And within that, they've got variations like GAN Sense, which adds um, current sensing for better control and protection. Okay. And GAN Safe, which is designed to meet really tough safety standards like you need in cars. Makes sense. And then there's the silicon carbide side. Yes, that's their Genesic line. That tackles the really high power, high voltage applications we mentioned. And to tie it all together, they also have ISOFAST gate drivers to control these advanced chips. Okay, comprehensive. Now, moving to the really big news lately, this NVIDIA partnership. That certainly turned some heads. Oh, absolutely. Huge news. Navitas is collaborating with NVIDIA on a, well, pretty advanced 800 volt high voltage direct current HVDC power architecture. And this is specifically for NVIDIA's next gen AI data centers. That's right. It's designed to power their upcoming Kyber rack systems, which will house future GPUs like the Rubin Ultra, big stuff. So we're talking about the power infrastructure needed for the next wave of AI. What's the time frame here? The plan seems to be for full scale production around 2027. It aligns with when NVIDIA expects to roll out those Kyber systems. So it's a bit further out, but a significant roadmap item. Definitely a longer term play, but a major one. Yeah. Being chosen by NVIDIA, given their dominance in AI, mm -hmm. that's a massive vote of confidence for Navitas. Yeah, feels like a huge validation. It really is. Analysts jumped on this, saying it confirms Navitas' technology leadership. It seriously boosts their profile in that booming AI data center market. And that market has, well, enormous power challenges, right? Exactly. AI workloads are incredibly power hungry. Power consumption and density are major headaches for data centers. Traditional power setups are hitting their limits. So Navitas Tech helps solve that. It's a key piece of the puzzle. Their GAN and CHAYS are essential for making this shift to the more efficient 800 volt standard feasible. They've shown off some impressive power supply designs like uh, an, an 8.5 kilowatt unit hitting 98% efficiency wow. and a 12 kilowatt one at nearly 98% too. That's the kind of performance needed. This sounds like it could translate into some serious revenue eventually. The potential is certainly there for significant long-term growth tied directly to those Kyber deployments from 2027 onwards. Right, but Navitas isn't profitable yet. Correct. That's the caveat. They're still loss-making. But a partnership like this gives them a clearer path to potentially scale revenue significantly. The market definitely sees the potential. You saw the stock jump. High expectations there. So just to clarify, are Navita cost chips going inside the NVIDIA GPUs themselves? Ah, good question. No, it's about the power delivery system for the GPUs within those Kyber racks. Okay. So Navita scan and SIA devices will be in the power supplies, the converters, the infrastructure that takes power from the grid, converts it to 800 VDC, and then delivers it efficiently right down to the voltages the GPUs need. So grid to GPU power management, essentially, using GAN for some parts, C for others. Exactly. GAN likely for the um, 
lower voltage conversion stages, closer to the processor, maybe 80, 120 V ranges, mm -hmm. and see it handling the really high power conversion from the 800 V input. It's the power system, not the GPU chip itself. Got it. That distinction is important. But still, the partnership itself is a massive credibility boost. Absolutely. It's like getting the ultimate seal of approval from the leader in the field. It reinforces that message about their technology lead. One analyst even called it a multi-year technology lead. And you'd expect this to attract other major data center players? It seems very likely, yes. Yeah. That kind of validation from NVIDIA makes Navitas much more attractive to other hyperscalers. Mm -hmm. And we're already seeing their data center project pipeline grow. They mentioned 75 projects as of May, up quite a bit from last year. This NVIDIA deal just adds fuel to that fire. Let's dig into that 800 volt HVDC a bit more. Why is it such a game changer for AI data centers? Well, with power demand skyrocketing, the old 48 volt systems just aren't cutting it. Moving to 800 volts drastically reduces the current needed for the same amount of power. Ah, PIV. Higher V means lower I for the same P. Exactly. And lower current means you can use much thinner copper cables. We're talking mm. potentially like a 45% reduction in copper. That's huge savings in cost and weight for massive data centers. Wow. It also streamlines the power conversion steps, cutting down energy losses, potentially improving efficiency by up to 5%, plus direct power to racks, less maintenance, lower cooling needs. It all adds up to a lower total cost of ownership, maybe up to 30% less. And Navitas's role is crucial in those efficient DC-DC converters inside the racks. Precisely. You need highly efficient converters to step that 800V down safely and effectively to power the actual servers and GPUs. That's where Vinian and Siki shine. The market reaction you mentioned it was pretty strong. Extremely positive. You looked at places like StockTwits, the sentiment was extremely bullish. And the stock price reflected that enthusiasm pretty clearly. Did they release any specific financial terms of the deal? No. Nothing specific has been disclosed publicly. We know it's strategically important, likely involves significant future volume. But the actual contract value, payment structures, that's all under wraps for now. How does this change their position versus competitors? It gives them a significant edge, I'd say. Yeah. Having this kind of high-profile design win with the market leader, it sets them apart from competitors who don't have something similar. It really cements their image as an innovator. But it's not without risks, surely. Execution is key. Absolutely. There are definitely risks. NVIDIA themselves noted that HVVC protection technology still needs work. So technological hurdles exist. Right. Then there's the execution risk. Can Navitas actually ramp up production reliably and meet the volume demands come 2027? That's a big question. And competition. NVIDIA probably won't sole source this. Very likely they'll maintain multiple suppliers for such critical components. Plus, you always have market risks. Will AI infrastructure demand continue at this pace? And, of course, Navity's own financial capacity, being currently unprofitable, and their reliance on foundries for manufacturing. Lots to watch. Makes sense. This partnership must be heavily influencing their R&D priorities now. Oh, undoubtedly. Expect an even sharper focus on high-power, high-voltage GAN and CC tailored for these data center needs. Things like advanced digital control, they have something called IntelliWeave system-level solutions, reliability, thermal management. It all becomes even more critical. And collaborating within that NVIDIA 800V ecosystem will be key. Okay, so beyond the huge NVIDIA news, Navitas hasn't been sitting still. They've announced other partnerships and wins too, right? That's right. They're clearly building a wider base. For example, they partnered with Great Wall Power in China. What's that involved? Developing a really dense 2.5 kilowatt or DC-DC converter using their GANSense tech. It targets AI data centers, telecom, industrial applications, mainly in China, focus on 400 volt systems. Interesting. Any others? Yeah, they set up a joint R&D lab with Giga Device, another big Chinese player, but in microcontrollers. Okay. The idea there is to integrate Navitas's GANFAST with Giga Device's MCUs to optimize control for power systems in AI data centers, EVs, solar. Yeah. Leveraging Giga Device's huge reach in China. Smart move, leveraging local strength. Seems like it. And they also have a dual sourcing partnership with Infineon. Infineon. A major competitor, aren't they? They are, which makes it interesting. It's for a new 48-volt GAN platform, also aimed at AI data centers, EVs, and even AI robotics. Dual sourcing gives customers confidence in supply. So building relationships across the board. And what about actual companies using their chips in products now? Quite a few big names. Dell uses both GANFAST and Genesic in their AI notebook adapters, apparently the broadest GAN adapter range out there. Okay. Then there's Chingonado in China. That's a big one. 
they're set to be the first to put an Avitis GAN-based onboard charger into mass production for an EV. A GAN onboard charger in production, that's significant. When? Production ramp is expected in early 2026. Wow, okay, who else? Samsung uses GAN fast in chargers for their Galaxy phones, including the flagships and foldables. Xiaomi too, another huge mobile player. Lenovo uses them for laptop adapters. OPPO Realm. Basically, they say they'd supply 10 out of 10 top smartphone and notebook OEMs. So strong in mobile and computing adapters. Very strong. And as we mentioned, the data center pipeline is growing. Over 75 projects now. EV projects are over 200 in the pipeline. With 40 wins secured last year, mostly Sushi. But that Chang'an win is key. And they're pushing it to appliances and industrial too. That Chang'an auto deal, let's circle back. Why is that so important? It's the first announced production GAN EV onboard charger. It's a major validation for GAN and the demanding automotive space. Partnering with a huge Chinese EV maker gives them scale and credibility. And having that clear production timeline early 2026 is crucial. It proves GAN isn't just theory for EVs. Right, a real milestone. And for Dell, what are the benefits they're seeing? The usual GAN advantages. Dell's adapters get like 3x the power, charge 3x faster, but are half the size and weight compared to older silicon ones. Plus high efficiency, cool operation, and it supports Dell's sustainability goals with less material. And Samsung and Xiaomi using their chips just confirms their dominance in mobile charging. Pretty much. Having those two giants on board is huge validation. Mm -hmm. They're a clear leader in mobile fast charging, hundreds of charger models launched using their tech. Any mention of Tesla in their materials? That's always a big question in the SISC space, especially. No, nothing in the material we reviewed indicated any current partnership or deal with Tesla. Okay, so how do all these partnerships and wins fit into their overall strategy? It seems to be multi-pronged. Building an ecosystem, gaining market access in key regions like China, advancing the technology through collaboration, accelerating adoption, and just overall geographic expansion. Partnerships seem to be a core strategic focus right from the board level. They mentioned securing design wins in 2024 with a lifetime potential revenue of $450 million. Yes, and a customer pipeline valued at $2.4 billion at the end of 2024, nearly double the previous year. But it's crucial to remember these are potential revenues, design wins, pipeline figures. They are not firm orders or guaranteed revenue yet. Right, important distinction. When would we expect to see revenue from these wins? It's a multi-year process. Some might start contributing later in 2025, but more significant ramps are expected in 2026 and beyond. Robo design wins usually convert fastest, maybe around a year. Data center and EV take longer. Okay. They did say EV GAN revenue could start by the end of 2025, likely linked to Chang'an ramping in early 26. Data center shipments apparently started in the second half of 2024, with a substantial ramp expected through this year and next. Solar GAN microinverters are launching this summer. So things are starting to move, but the big impact is still ahead. That seems to be the message for management. These wins are expected to drive growth despite the current near-term headwinds they're facing. Okay, let's pivot to those financials and the headwinds. How has revenue looked recently? It's been a bit bumpy. Q1 of this year, 2025, revenue was $14.0 million. That was actually down quite a bit, nearly 40% compared to Q1 last that year. Is. Yeah. Q4 2024 was $18.0 million, also down year over year. Q3 2024 was $21.7 million, a slight dip. Q2 2024 was actually up year over year at $20.5 million. So the last couple of quarters have definitely shown those headwinds, particularly in EV, solar, and industrial markets. What else came out of that Q1 2025 earnings report? Well, the $14 million revenue was in line with their guidance, so they hit their target even if it was lower year over year. They reported a gap net loss of $16.8 million. Still significantly loss-making. Yes. On a non-gap basis, their gross margin was okay at 38.1%, though gap was much lower. A positive sign was that they reduced operating expenses, especially non-gap OPEX, down to $17.2 million, showing some cost control. Okay, and their cash position? Ended Q1 with $75.1 million in cash and equivalents, and importantly, no debt. They highlighted some technical progress, like bidirectional GAN, that 12 kilowatt PSU, new CC products, and hitting 250 million CAN units shipped with high reliability. What's the guidance for Q2? Pretty similar to Q1. Revenue projected between $14.0 and $15.0 million. Non-GAAP gross margin around 38.5%, and they expect non-GAAP OPEX to drop further to about $15.5 million. So still navigating challenges, but trying to manage costs. Exactly. The CEO acknowledged the headwinds, but reiterated confidence in growth later this year and beyond, driven by those design wins converting. 
We know they're not profitable. What's the plan or timeline for that? They're targeting EBITDA break-even sometime in 2026. EBITDA break-even, meaning earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization hit zero. Correct. Basically, their core operations covering their cash operating costs. To get there, they estimate needing quarterly revenue in the high $30 million range. So quite a jump from the current $14, $15 million level. That's a significant ramp needed. It is. They emphasize cost reductions and have a steering committee focused solely on accelerating profitability. But ultimately, it hinges on converting those design wins and seeing market adoption really take off. The NVIDIA deal is seen as a potential major catalyst here. Their cash balance, $75.1 million, seems decent. How's the cash burn? They used about $11, $12 million in cash during Q1. Management stated they believe they have enough cash runway for, quote, well over seven quarters as of May 2025. So over a year and a half at that burn rate. Yes. And they expect that cash usage to decrease as revenue starts to grow and cost controls continue. Plus, remember, no debt. They set up an ATM facility earlier this year, right? And at the market equity program for $50 million. They did back in March with Jeffries. But as of the Q1 report in May, they hadn't issued any shares under it. So it's there if they need it, but not actively using it. Exactly. It provides flexibility, a strategic option, but management seems confident it's not an immediate necessity given the current cash balance and runway. So they don't foresee needing another big capital raise soon. Based on their public statements, no. They believe the current cash is sufficient for the foreseeable future, banking on that revenue growth taking in and reducing the burn rate. Okay, let's try to summarize all this for potential investors. What are the main takeaways on Navitas? All right, key points. First, they have genuinely innovative GAN and Seek technology with clear performance advantages. That's the foundation. Right. Second, that NVIDIA partnership is strategically huge. It validates their tech and positions them right in the middle of the massive AI data center growth trend, albeit with revenue impact further out. Okay, tech and NVIDIA. What else? Third, they're building a diverse customer base beyond just NVIDIA, strong presence in mobile charging, key wins in EV like Chang'an, growing in data centers, solar, industrial, lots of irons in the fire with significant traction in China. Diversification is good. Fourth. That design win pipeline is substantial, pointing towards significant future growth potential, even if it's not guaranteed revenue yet. Potential is there. And the financial. Fifth, the current financial picture shows near-term revenue struggles and ongoing losses. That's the reality right now. But they have a solid cash position, no debt, and a stated path towards profitability targeting that EBITDA break-even in 2026. So innovative tech, big partnerships, broad customer potential, but facing current headwinds and needing to execute on profitability. That sums it up pretty well. Yeah. High potential, but also execution risks and a need for patience. What are the key things investors should really keep an eye on going forward? Definitely watch the execution of that NVIDIA partnership. Any updates on the 800V architecture development and the timeline for Kyber deployment in 2027. Okay. Track the conversion of those design wins into actual revenue. Our shipment ramps starting as expected in late 2025 and through 2026. That's crucial. Revenue conversion, got it. Monitor their progress towards profitability. Are they hitting those OPEX reduction goals? Yeah, Is revenue growing towards that high $30 million quarterly target needed for EBITDA break even in 2026? Profitability path. And finally, just keep watching the broader adoption trends for GAN and CC in their key markets, data centers, EVs, solar, mobile. Continued market pull is essential for their long-term success. Lots to monitor there. So as we wrap up this deep dive on Navita Semiconductor, maybe the final thought for you, our listeners on Stock Explorers, is this. Really consider the transformative shift happening with these next-gen power semiconductors. They're enabling so many future technologies. Right. And think about Navita's strategic positioning within that shift, the technology they have, the key partnerships they're landing. Is their pure play focus on GAN and SIN the right bet for this future? Definitely something to ponder. As always, use what we've discussed as a starting point for your own research. Don't just take our word for it. Absolutely. Do your homework. And if you found this deep dive helpful, please do subscribe to Stock Explorers. Give us that thumbs up and hit the notification bell so you won't miss our next session digging into another company.